Welcome to this video on Christian cosmology. This video is brought to you by Mysterium Fidei. Look us up on Facebook if you find that you like systematic theology videos like this. Today we are going to learn the Christian constellations, and you are going to learn so much theology in this video that it's really more theology than astronomy. If you would like to use the various materials that you see in this video, you can find a link to purchase them in the video description down below. Before we begin, we should go through the sources of where this comes from. First, it comes from Old Testament cosmology, especially visions of the heavenly sanctuary by Moses, also of the throne of God in Ezekiel, carried about on top of the cherubim, also of the empires in Daniel, and also greatly of the Messiah motifs in the last half of Isaiah as well as Isaiah 11. A lot of the constellations here are also going to come from New Testament cosmology. Descriptions of the heavenly sanctuary in the book of Hebrews by Paul. Also the throne of God in the book of Revelation, chapter 4. Also empires, also in the book of Revelation in chapters about 11 to 13. And then lastly, about Christ's headship in Colossians 1. Of course, these are just the major sources. There are many others in addition to these. Prior to learning the constellations, you probably want to watch this other video of mine to see how the heavens turn and how they appear from your perspective standing on the earth. So if you find yourself wondering what the red ecliptic line is here or why the night sky doesn't seem to appear the way it appears in this video, then you probably want to watch that video there. There is a link to it down in the video description. So anyways, the Christian constellations. To understand this, we have to go back to the book of Genesis, when God created the heavens and the earth and divided the waters from the waters, the waters above the firmament from the waters below the firmament. And the waters below he called seas, which if you read through like the symbolism in the Old Testament, the seas symbolize the Gentile nations, all surging and foaming and roaring and raging. You can see that in like in the book of Daniel, when all the monsters come out of the seas and stamp upon the earth. Well, what then is the earth? Well, the earth is the dry land, symbolizing the Jews, or at least the Semitic cultures that stay pretty well stationary in the world, not really traveling around and changing their flavor with cosmopolitan fashions. Okay, additionally, there is the mountain of the Lord which is a spiritual mountain, symbolizes spiritual growth. In order to dwell in the mountain and dwell high on the mountain, close to God, you have to leave behind your earthly passions and lusts. And even non-Christians, like maybe even the Buddha, probably lived up here to a degree, even though he was without grace. Nevertheless, that leaves space, which is the realm of heaven, or at least symbolizes heaven. In fact, all these things are not really there. There is not a real ocean up in the sky. No, no, no. All these things up in the sky are mere symbols to convey a reality and truths to us, to teach us God's message of revelation about salvation. Then, the most striking and obvious part of the night sky is the Milky Way, which if you look up, it looks like a bright band of packed with stars, that it almost glows and effervesces. And this symbolizes Christ's way through the heavens, which is the path of souls and saints and angels who have gone after the way that he went before us. So now we've divided up the various areas. I also want to tell you the astronomical terms for the various latitudes. First off, in the middle we have the zodiacal constellations, the 12 constellations of the zodiac. And we Christians don't believe in this because using the zodiac and following horoscopes is a really bad idea. It doesn't do anything for you except prime you to be superstitious and alert to vain observances. Whereas God has given us free will to choose right or wrong and our destiny is not controlled by the stars or if it is in some sense, still it is up to our will and God's grace, which we can ask for, to make the best of it independent of whatever it might otherwise have resulted in. So I strongly urge you not to get into the superstition. In fact, it's often taken control of by devils and can be dangerous to you, and spiritually dangerous to you. And spiritual danger often becomes psychological and physical danger soon after. 
So save yourself and avoid this from the beginning. Nevertheless, even the constellations of the zodiac are made by God, and you will see what great wonderful mysteries are in them if you understand them correctly rather than as divination tools to try to tell the future. So those are in the center. Up at the top and at the bottom we have what are called the circumpolar constellations because they go circular around the pole. And then in the middle, the term for those are mid-latitude constellations. So if I say something, this is a circumpolar, you know where I'm talking about. And if I say this is a zodiac, you want to look somewhere in the middle. All right, so now let's go learn the gospel from the stars. Indeed, the heavens are telling the glory of God. The skies proclaim his handiwork. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night their song is with him. There is no nation, no place where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out to all the nations, their words to the ends of the earth. Now we could view the night sky like this, and this is how it is actually viewed. When you look out, you only see about this much of the sky, and it curves up above you, so that like an ant looking up at a room full of spectators, it is hard to tell what is where, and you're constantly losing your sense of up and feeling like you are being watched rather than you being the watcher. So although this centrifugal or center fleeing way is the real way that you see constellations, I'm going to switch into a centripetal way, which is much more easy for us humans to get our eyes and mind around. So I'm going to project the whole night sky of constellations onto the Earth here. So now, instead of stuff curving up away from you, now it is curving down into itself, and it's much easier to keep track of up and down and the equator and things like that. Okay, so here we see our constellations, and the celestial equator is right here between heaven and the ocean, and you can see the white path here is God's way through the heavens, the Milky Way, that symbolizes all the saints and angels before us. Up at the poles, we have the Little Dipper here, and then the Big Dipper is over there. And then at the Southern Pole, we have basically nothing. And the reason for that is because nearly all of the minor Southern Hemisphere constellations were established by this guy, Peter Plankius, who was a Dutch astronomer. And as you can see in the yellow here, he created constellations that are theologically insignificant completely. So I don't use these except for several of the fish. And as you can see in the yellow here, these constellations are neither ancient nor theologically significant. Furthermore, they are all relatively small, minor little shapes, which are in no way distinctive when you look at the southern sky. So not only do I not use these, but I even change one or two of them. Now the main exceptions to this are the big Southern Hemisphere constellations. The ship, the beast from the sea, Hydra, and the cup here are all ancient. There are, in fact, two other constellations that I don't know what to do with. Um, on the left here, we've got Lupus, the wolf, and on the right here, we've got Centaurus, Chiron the centaur, half man in front and half horse behind. And Chiron was supposedly a teacher of the royalty in the classical world but I don't know what to do with those. I don't even know what they look like that has anything of a theological significance. So those are also there. One possibility is that when I look at the really bright stars here, um, sometimes it looks to me like this might be the bottomless pit, but that's probably a mistranslation in the Revised Standard Version. It probably just means the abyss, which means the deep part of the sea. But maybe that's fine. Maybe these two constellations just symbolize things on the bottom of the seafloor. There certainly are, after all, several constellations around the southern pole, minor little geometric shapes that look like nothing but rocks on the bottom of the sea. Whatever. But yeah, that's the only ancient constellation that I actually change and distort the star shapes on. Also, please note that occasionally I will put up the astronomical or mythological name of a constellation on red in the left here, with a white description of it on the right. Also, sometimes I'll put up a constellation that is actually composed of several astronomical or mythological constellations, and so that will look like this. So those of you who want to learn these names or look up a certain constellation can do that. So what does all this mean? 
Where do we start to learn the history of mankind? Because what is man or the son of man that thou art mindful of him? The earth is like a drop in the bucket. It is regarded as dust upon the scales. After Adam's fall into sin, humanity got spread out through the world by the propagation of the human race. And this is symbolized both by land creatures and by the nations, which are the sea creatures, such as Leviathan. And in between the earth, which represents the Jews, and the ocean, which represents the Gentiles, there's also the sand of the sea. Whose location is indicated by Capricornus here, which mythologically was a half goat, half fish, but which historically was probably just the ancient people's way of trying to describe a seal. So the sand of the sea kind of symbolizes both ocean and the land, and thereby represents the multitude of the human race. Sadly for us, though we are made for God and our minds are made to scale the heavens, we find ourselves trapped upon the earth of our own bodies and passions, in our bodily, fleshly nature. And who has done this but the serpent in the garden that once upon a time caused our forefather Adam to fall so that God said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between her seed and yours. He will strike at your head while you strike at his heel. And this serpent also symbolizes the dragon because it is said that the devil went into the serpent to tempt and cause Adam to sin. So as a result of original sin, we humans are struggling with our passions and sometimes it bites us and we commit sins. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Trembling has seized the godless. Who among us can dwell with the devouring fire of God? Who among us can dwell with everlasting burnings? Who? He who walks righteously and speaks uprightly, who despises the gain of oppression, who shakes his hand lest he hold a bribe, who stops his ears and he from hearing of bloodshed and shuts his eyes from looking upon evil. He will dwell upon the heights. His place of defense will be the fortress of the rocks. His bread will be given him. His water will be sure. And even Christians must still struggle with these passions. But more than this, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint, for the love of God has been poured forth into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, which has been given to us. Keep in mind that none of this passes away. This is an aspect of human nature forever, both in the Old Testament times and in New Testament times. Grace does not remove human nature. Grace only builds on it or adds something additional on top of it. But there have always been those who conquered their passions, symbolized by the strong man. This is the constellation Hercules. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord and who may stand in his holy place? He whose hearts are clean, whose eyes are pure, who desires not the vanity of earth. They will receive a blessing from the Lord and vindication from their God. Such is the generation of they who seek your face, O God of Jacob, who climb the mountain top, who leave the flesh below and seek spiritually what is above. And throughout all the Old Testament, these people were seeking to achieve the promises that God had promised to those who did this, which is symbolized by the Old Covenant. They were seeking to have the blood and the water of the covenant poured out upon them. In fact, Moses, when he inaugurated it, sprinkled them with the blood of the covenant, which is symbolized by this ladle. But there was somebody that was preventing this grace, this blood and water and redemption from reaching them. And that someone was the dragon, who leaves Paul complaining in the book of Romans, What then? Are we Jews better off? No, not at all. For all men, both Jews and Greeks, have fallen under the power of sin. Even the mighty men, like John the Baptist and Elijah and Elisha, Enoch and Methuselah, all of them were prevented by their own sin, for all have sin at some point. And so the dragon has obtained control over all men. And so the apostle John had a vision and he said, And another sign appeared in the heavens. Behold, a great dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and seven diadems, one upon each head. And his tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them down to the earth, which symbolizes, of course, the angels, and even afterwards, many of the saints, many of those in the church, often get swept down. For as the prophecy said, 
The Son of Man was set for the rising and the setting of many in Judah. But there was another adversary against the dragon, who laid the seed of his eventual overthrow, and that is the plowman, who symbolizes both hard work, the Jewish line working hard by the sweat of their brow for centuries to work their way back from original sin and restore human nature from concupiscence, and also the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Hence, the Holy Offspring will be called the Son of God. And who is this in relation to? But in relation to the Virgin foretold from all eternity, when God said, I will set enmity between you and the woman, between her seed and yours, O serpent, O dragon. So for all eternity, the virgin who would, without seed of man, but just by her own seed, who would bring the salvation of the world, was foretold in the stars and foretold in many, many prophecies, both among the pagan nations and among the Jews. And if you want to read more about that, you probably should read the writings of Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich. But the Bible says it too. Behold, who is she that comes forth up in the stars as the morning rising, fair as the moon, Bright as the sun, terrible as an army set in battle array. Who is she? Who will she be someday? And the Apostle John said, A great sign appeared in the heaven. Behold, a woman clothed in the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of twelve stars upon her head. And it was foretold, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. And this is the name by which he will be called, the Lord our righteousness. So we see then that the offspring of the woman is then the constellation Libra, the scales, which represent the just one. Jesus Christ, the Lord our righteousness. Kindness and truth have meet, justice and peace have kissed. Truth shall spring out of the earth, and justice shall look down from heaven. And so the serpent, that dragon, who is the devil and Satan, when he saw that he could not destroy the seed of the woman by spewing an ocean of water out to conquer her, he was angry with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her seed on those who keep the commandments of God and bear testimony to Jesus. And he stood upon the sand of the sea. But the child itself was caught up to God and to his throne, and he grew in wisdom and knowledge, and a new covenant was poured out upon him, because the promises of God were not to Abraham, but to his seed. The lion shall lie down with the lamb, and a little child shall leap. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea. Then one of the elders said to me, Weep not, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, is conquered, so that he can open the seal and break open the scrolls. And between the throne and the four living creatures, I saw not a lion, but a lamb, standing as though it had been slain. Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Happy are we who are called to his banquet. But the Son of Man, the Lion of Judah, the Lamb of God, fully God and fully man, did not consider equality with God something to be striven after, but rather he took upon himself the form of a servant and became obedient even unto death. Yes, even death on a cross. Therefore, God highly exalted him and set him above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee must bend above the earth and under the earth, and every tongue proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. And to the Apostle John in his vision, the risen Lord said, I was dead, and behold, now I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and of Hades, so that if anyone believes in me, though he die, yet he will he live. And if anyone lives believing in me, he will never see death. But as for the cowards, the adulterers, and those who practice immorality, their lot is the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. 
And as St. John stood under the cross and saw the Roman soldier puncture his side with a lance, he said that water and blood came out from his side, fulfilling the prophecy of Ezekiel. For our Lord had said, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. But he spoke not of the temple, but of his own body. And so this fulfilled the prophecy of the prophet Ezekiel. I saw water issuing from the right side of the temple, and it flowed off towards the east, down into the dry land, the Arabah, the Dead Sea. First it was a mere stream, then a river, and then a mighty torrent that would not be crossed. And the angel of the Lord said to me, Son of man, have you seen this? This water flows toward the eastern region and goes down into the dry Arabah. And when it enters the stagnant waters of the sea, the water will become fresh, and wherever the river goes, every living creature which swarms will live. For the water goes there, that the sea may become fresh, and the Dead Sea will become a place for the spreading of nets, and every living creature will flourish there, living here meaning not living naturally, but living by grace. And if you want to read more about this river, I suggest you look into the final chapter of the book of Revelation. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And he sent out his apostles, the fishermen, the sailors of the bark of Peter, to go and preach the gospel to all nations, and to baptize them into the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, so that the apostle Paul would say, Unless you stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. So ever after that, the ship has been a symbol of the church sailing upon the waters. But the ship is not alone, for it has the cross to guide it, which also represents the Lord walking on the waters ahead of it. But the Lord did not just rise from the dead. He also ascended to the Father to stand there on our behalf and make atonement and intercession for us. For the tent of meeting which Moses had seen in his visions and upon which he had modeled the Jewish tent and temple of the old law was merely a copy and shadow of the heavenly sanctuary, wherein man would someday have access to God. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God, saying, See that you make everything according to the pattern which was shown to you on the mountain. And Christ entered not into a sanctuary made with human hands, a copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf, he entered once for all into the holy place, taking not the blood of goats and calves, but his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption by the new and the living way which he opened up for us through his flesh. For remember all of this, all of creation is created in him, as it says in the book of Colossians. So there is only access to God through his flesh. He is the head above all things, and all things were created through him, and in him, and for him, so that there is no longer any dividing line between Jew and Greek, slave or free, woman or man, for all are one in Christ Jesus, the incarnate word, pre-existent from all eternity with the Father, to whom the Father said, a prince from the day of your birth upon the holy mountains, from the womb before the dawn I have begotten you. And by that offering we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every Jewish priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, then he sat down at the right hand of God there to wait until his enemies should be made his footstool beneath his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Let us then draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and grace. And not just now, but at the end of the world, the Son of Man will come in his glory, and all the angels with him and he will sit upon his glorious throne. And he will separate the sheep from the goats. And he will say to the sheep, Come, O blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. 
For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was sick and in prison, and a stranger, and you welcomed me. But to the goats, those who tread down with their feet out of the rest of their pasture, and muddy the water with their dirty hoofs, and prod, and joust, and ram, he will say, Depart from me, you accursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was sick, and in prison, and a stranger, and you did not walk. Then the righteous will go into eternal life, and the accursed into eternal punishment. And we Christians are also called to follow the way in which Christ trod. For at the base of his way through the heavens, there is the symbol of prudence. Prudence, St. Thomas says, is like a light projecting into the future, or like an archer aiming for some high or lofty goal. And if we could see where his arrow was, the arrow, which is called the constellation Sagata, is right about here in the Milky Way. So that's telling us that the archer, Sagittarius, who shot the arrow Sagita, first shot a shot up through the Milky Way. And what does that shot symbolize? Well, it symbolizes the Christian's intention. We must intend and seek the higher things that are above and intend to lay aside every stumbling block of the flesh and run the race that is set before us. Notice that we are now going not by human effort up the mountain of the Lord, but now it can only be done by grace, which comes from faith. And the first job of one who intends to ascend the mountain of the Lord is to kill something in us. And what is that? It is the serpent and sin. So that is what Sagittarius is doing. And in fact, Sagittarius is forever doing that because that has to be our first priority because we cannot force grace upon us. Grace can only come to us if God wills to give it to us. But the one thing we can do, which is in our power, as the book of Sirach says, it is in your power to reject sin. You do not need grace, at least in the short term, you do not need grace to shoot dead every temptation that comes from the tempter. But God will not leave us without help. He assists our spirit to ascend where Christ ascended first. Our spirit assisted by the Holy Spirit so this constellation Aquila, which is the eagle, also symbolizes a spirit mounting up to God. Indeed, our spirit is in the eternal spirit of God's Holy Spirit, who is divine, the third person of the Blessed Trinity. And where is that spirit heading? At least for us Christians, it is heading to the cross. Notice that this is not a physical cross. This is a spiritual cross because our spiritual sacrifices, which we make for one another through the mystical body of Christ, through the communion of the saints, enable us to merit grace for many other people. And where does that grace get poured out? But it gets poured out from the ladle of the new dispensation. Because whenever God sees his son, or sees one of us in the image of his son, especially his son upon the cross, then he gives us grace and the meriting of other graces, both for ourselves and for others. So this constellation Cygnus, which is the swan, but for us it is the crucifix, is something that we must pass through before we end our lives and enter into the tent where our Lord has gone first. Indeed, this is a good time to think about what this Milky Way symbolizes, this path through the heavens. This prophecy said, Thou ascended the high mount, leading captives in thy train, and you received gifts from men, even among the rebellious, that the Lord God may dwell there. But Christ did not just ascend, he also descended. And similarly, our path following Christ through the heavens doesn't just ascend up there. It also descends through this world, the oceans and struggles of this world. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with Christ in the death of baptism, so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So Christians also tread the way that Christ went before us through the seas, both in the institution of the church, and there are many Christians out there who are not in the visible institution of the church, 
but are nevertheless there, baptized into Christ, and will remain there, and be drawn out from there at the close of the age, when the fish will be harvested and placed into buckets, as the parable said, and the net will be emptied into the new Jerusalem, the bride of Christ that comes down from heaven, from God. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net which was thrown into the sea and gathered full of fish. And when it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into vessels, but they threw away the bad. So it will be at the close of the age. The angels will come and separate out the evil from the righteous, and they will throw the evil into the furnace of fire, and there will, men will weep and gnash their teeth. And I saw the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling of God is with men. Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls, and spoke to me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And in the spirit he carried me up upon a great high mountain, and he showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, like jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall and twelve gates, and at the twelve gates twelve angels, and the names of the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel inscribed upon them. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Notice the twelve foundations are different colors, one on every edge of the cube. The city lies four square. Its length and its breadth and its height are all measured the same. 12,000 stadia, or 1,200 miles. He also measured its wall, 144 cubits, by a man's measure. That's 144 feet thick. The wall was made of jasper and was pure gold, clear as glass. And the foundations of the city were adorned with every jewel that was on the breastplate of the high priest of the Old Testament, as a symbol that that priest was looking forward to this city, the city that has foundations that Abraham looked forward to. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord, the God Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine upon it, for the glory of the Lord is its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light shall the nations walk, and the kings of the earth shall bring their glory into it. And its gates shall never be shut day or night, but no unclean thing shall enter into it, no one who practices abomination or falsehood, but only those whose names are written in the book of life of the Lamb. And indeed, Christ is not just upon this throne, but just as all creation is in him, so also he is called the way. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life, the way through the heaven. And Jacob, our forefather, left Beersheba and went toward Haran, and he dreamed that there was a ladder stretching from heaven to earth. And behold, angels were ascending and descending upon the ladder. And Jacob woke from his dream and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than Bethel, the house of God and gate of heaven. For Christ, when he ascended to the Father, disarmed the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. Those are two of the nine choirs of angels. And he made a public example of them, triumphing over them in himself. Therefore it is said, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. And so when Elijah was picked up by the flaming chariot and carried up into heaven, it was through Jesus Christ. And when Elijah returns again, it will also be through Jesus Christ. And I will grant my two witnesses power to prophesy. These are the two who stand by the Lord of all the earth, as the book of Zechariah said. And Jesus said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. And in this case, we have the constellation Gemini. These are the two anointed who stand by the Lord of all the earth. Traditionally, it refers to Enoch and Elijah, who were the only two humans who were taken up without yet dying. They will die at the end. And if anyone would harm them, fire pours out from their mouth and consumes their foes. They have the power to shut the sky that no rain may fall and to smite the earth with every plague as often as they desire. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast 
that ascends from the bottomless pit will make war upon them, and their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which is allegorically called Sodom, in Egypt. For three and a half days men will rejoice and give presents to one another, but then the two prophets, having at last died, will be taken up from there in the sight of their foes. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with seven heads and ten horns in the image of the ancient Roman Empire, and with a blasphemous name upon its heads. And its feet were like a bear's, and it was like a leopard, and its mouth like a lion's mouth. And it ascended from the bottomless pit, or by another translation, from the abyss. The beast that you saw was, and is not, and is to come. And the seven heads are seven mountains, on which the woman is seated. There are also seven kings, five of whom have fallen, one is, and the other has not yet come, letting you know that these kings are in succession. And the ten horns that you saw, they and the beast will hate the harlot someday, and they will make her desolate and naked and devour her and tear her flesh and burn her with fire. This is the great harlot who is seated upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and with the wine of whose fornication the dwellers on earth have become drunk. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. The woman was arrayed in purple and red, bedecked with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a cup of abominations and of the impurities of her fornication. This is commercial culture and materialism taken to an extreme. And on her forehead was written a name of mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of harlots and of earth's abominations. And I saw the woman, drunk with the blood of the saints, and the blood of the martyrs of the church. And he said to me, The woman that you saw is the great city, Babylon, which has dominion over the kings of the earth.